Make It Right, the manufacturing podcast. Manufacturing is about making stuff. It generally happens in factories. Materials come in as one thing and they go out as something completely different. No matter what you're making, materials get transformed into something else during a manufacturing process. And that's kind of cool when you think about it. I'm Janet Eastman, and this week on Make It Right, our guest is a manufacturing executive who's a mechanical engineer with an MBA and a master's certificate in supply chain management. He's worked in South Africa, Belgium, and the U.S. in seven different manufacturing plants in automotive and fast-moving consumer goods sectors. And like my colleague, Kevin Snook, he is passionate about manufacturing. So we are really pleased to have Lionel Moss as our guest on Make It Right. Welcome to the show, Lionel. Good to see you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. So you actually, Mm -hmm. when we first initially talked, I got this sense from you that you actually take a different approach to viewing and establishing a manufacturing company's purpose. So I'd like your just how you see manufacturing and why you look at manufacturing in that way and a company's purpose. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, you know, Janet, so, so as I uh, you know, mentioned, um, um, I, I love manufacturing, of course, you know, I have a passion for manufacturing and I've, I have a vast experience having different roles in manufacturing. And over, over the years, I've learned that uh, we don't always necessarily get the mission across to our organization such that it can impact their personal growth and also their professional growth. So to make it a win-win uh, in, in uh, defining a, a, a uh, purpose or a mission statement for a manufacturing operation, I think it's important that we help our employees understand uh, the nature of the process we have in within which we transform the product from raw material to finished product, uh, as you mentioned, I think it's critically important that every process step, the nature of it is is clarified to an extent such that an individual can make a connect to it. And and one th- an example of that, for example, you know, in an, an assembly process, typically uh, one would think, where are the big or the large cost drivers? It would be within the waste of materials as we batch or as we process. So hence, you know, uh, understanding the competencies associated with that, such as process control or good quality controls, one would better align the organization with the nature of the business. And for me, um, that's one example, the same thing in a continuous process, which we can talk about some more, uh, but ultimately bringing that out in the purpose statement, helping managers, engineers, leaders uh, translate that uh, let's call it corporate mission statement as such, to something that's workable, uh, something that in actual fact people can connect to easy or, or easier. Um, I think this is a little little uh, lack uh, what attracts people to manufacturing. Um, you know, if I think of so many statements about, you know, delivering excellence in quality as a mission statement, those are good statements. Ultimately, that's the net outcome. But being the leader in, for example, process and product platform technologies, and and hence or thereby delivering, you know, uh, excellence and quality, for me makes a little more uh, business sense, and it helps people to connect to it somehow. Um, and I think that that's an important start. The nature of what we do is important for people to know. Um, so that they, in actual fact, can feel associated with it, or it's a path they want to go down and develop their career further, you know. And so that, for me, basically, is where I would uh, would love to to influence or or drive the the difference between just a, a statement that sits out there, a bold statement, and something people can do something with with within manufacturing. Do you have? Um an example that you can share with us where you went into a company and they had a mission statement and then you talk to the people and you says, this is really what we do. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So absolutely everywhere I've worked in, 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 in numerous factories uh, from the outset, uh, I, I look at the mission statement, um, share it with the organization, at least start with leadership 
and you know as we sort of decipher the content of it the the dialogue starts and and i've seen that in europe i've seen that in south africa i've seen that in the us um my i, I do this kind of health check at different levels in the organization and, and it's so obvious that when we talk about what we do um for example if innovation is in the statement or uh, delivering you know high quality products uh, we get into so what actually you know how do we get to that end product of that 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 quality we start getting into the core competencies required to deliver against that nature of that process or that business we're getting into how we should be organized what the communication you know structure should look like uh, and we start getting into the line of, of how we are established. But most importantly, what I've seen is that we have managers and leaders with, uh, let's call it a maintenance background, a strong maintenance background, for example, which is, 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 is perfectly okay. And they are within a, a, let's say, a batching process where they lead an organization. It, it's, of course, a big plus. Ideally, we'd like the the... the thinking or the, the capability of someone with that's quality oriented or process control oriented in that environment. So, you know, uh, reorganizing some is, is always a good thing to align leadership, core competencies and skill with the nature of what the organization needs so they can be more effective. And then designing the organization such that those skills are also, you know, present across shifts. This is very, very important. And I've seen in Europe, for example, within two years, we increased productivity by 30%. I've seen double digit growth in the US as well, just by the mere fact that we reorganize and align people to uh, best match the technologies we, we employ. Now, um, I will say, uh, one thing I also see everywhere uh, present is our managers and leaders are somewhat, um, how shall I put it, stretched. The, the breadth of their, their job scope at times doesn't allow them to give enough attention to detail within a certain uh, um, uh, you know, process where, where, for example, things evolve over time um, and their coaching and their leadership is required to uh, spend sufficient time with the organization and help the organization grow. You know, if, if, if we don't see those small wins at all levels in the organization, it, it, it becomes less motivational for the organization. So I've, I've, I can uh, tell you in Europe, for example, where we had seven product lines supplying batteries uh, across Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, parts of Africa, um, I can assure you it, it was a high process, a uh, you know, high continuous process, you know, high volume, low variety process. It was a batching process, pretty complex. But the value stream managers were really stretched across multiple uh, processes. So reorganizing that uh, sort of focus was pivotal for that turnaround. I mean, 30% productivity improvement over two years was pretty substantial. And there was no capital investment. It was just the, the focus on um, having that support infrastructure over 24 hours. I mean, if you think of a, a, a or a where you have sub processes connected through conveyance and different technologies, and there are numerous technologies within the line at you know running at let's say 600 or 1,000 units a minute um, or seven, you can imagine that there are core skills required within the shift for certain transformations. May you know where you apply a label on that same line, but then you know in the next shift you 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 would have the same challenge. So it's 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 important to make sure that within that department you have a skill that can support a subject matter expert that can support that labeling process and float to that line. Should there be a problem to be solved, um, the same goes for leadership, the frontline leadership, the departmental leadership, and then you know. Uh, over 24 seven, that's ultimately how we derive to the ideal design. Now I can go into the process technology extensively with you as well. Um, to set people up for success, problem solving happens at all levels and across all functions. 
And no one should ever underestimate the order of magnitude uh, in solving problems um, and what's required in view of support uh, systems. So support functions or non-core play a pivotal role in solving problems. We look at problems differently as managers, in engineers, directors, VPs and so forth, than what the frontline teams do. And, and their understanding and interpretation of how to solve a problem uh, may be different. So how do we take someone that's fairly new to the organization, feel confident that he, they would want to stay with the business, feel they have a career path with that business, and feel that they can actually make a difference because they can see it in their results. So we all have roles in, in a daily drumbeat or standard work process where we can guide and coach the frontline organization how to address a basic problem, whether it's a, a, a breakdown, so we categorize whether it's a problem that has you know, variable uh, drivers or causes, or whether it's a, a breakdown where it's just a simple YY or 5Y approach. Um, how to think about solving a problem sometimes to engineers and managers may become, you know, uh, sort of the, the norm, but we don't always convey that effectively. So do we need to design the organization such to match up with the process type? We also need to look at the right capability and how we as leaders should behave out in the organization to enable the organization to be successful. How do we solve problems at the front line? You know, how do we help an organization that have not been exposed to certain technologies in practice uh, actually have a good understanding and feel they can make a career out of it? You know, um, we evolve technologies from being pretty manual, ultimately to highly automated. We go from inline quality control checks to having inline vision systems. I mean, that, that's a, a quite a leap. That's a step change in how uh, we look at producing or transforming products. Um, and, and what about people, you know, how do we bring them along? How do they feel valued and they feel they can be successful? So for me, it starts with getting that purpose right. Uh, what is the true nature of your business? How do you transform product people and process into finished goods? all together to ensure it's a win-win. How do you pace that effort over time so that you know it's something truly transformational as, as a package and, and, and the customers are delighted. First and second moment of truth are realized um, by doing the right thing. Um, and I've, I've not seen it any different than I've seen it fail. Um, it's, it's a delicate balance of, um, and we have to be patient with out, you know, with this journey, uh, we have to pace the work. Um, and sometimes we have to do things, you know, that's a bit of a stretch. All of us, I think many of, many of us for certain have had that moment where you, you're, you know, you get a call from the CFO or CEO or a note or an email and say, you know, 10% more or whatever the case may be. So, you know, how prepared are we? Are, how do we translate that back to the, the organization? Um, and it's important to be proactive in that regard. So if we understand, if we take some time to understand the nature of our process, I believe we can better connect the, the competencies to it and, and we can better strategize as to how we're gonna go about um, delivering results. And for me is the key. Um, when we do that, we actually see opportunities that would, we would not commit for the next 12 months, let's say, if we do a budget year, we may have it in the pipeline to, to explore, to improve, uh, to verify and to commit for the fall. So really it's important to stay that step ahead of, of, of what's expected and required uh, to drive uh, results and deliver a sustainable you know, outcome. So, yeah, Lionel, you've, you've, you've covered a, an awful lot in there, and uh, yeah. <laughs> kind of like that, that's how to run a manufacturing business, pretty much in a nutshell, right? It, there's, oh, yeah. I wanted to pick up on a couple of points there. One of them was um, around this mission statement or the organizational vision direction. I call it a compelling business direction. 
Um, a lot of times when I see companies trying to work through that, they they get very much tied up in corporate speak. You know, like they, they feel like everything has to be in there. Like we've got to be the best quality. We've got to be the best customer service. We've got to have really good costs. We've got to like take care of all of our employees. We've got to be good to the environment and sustainable. And, you know, it, it's like, I can't miss any of these things out because they're all so important. And of course they are all important, but when you're crafting a, a direction for a specific company, how do you boil that down to something that's actually meaningful rather than just repetitive of what everybody's trying to say? Yeah, very, very good point. And I see exactly the same, uh, Kevin. Um, so um, getting in and understanding the results, spending a lot of time with, with the organization is very helpful. People, people would hear you out and they would, you know, uh, provide that support and they would, and you get that buy-in instantaneously by uh, listening to people a lot in the organization as to what they do day in, day out and getting to know people, you know, um, across functions. Um, and then most important, I spend a lot of time with results, trying to understand drivers, you know, uh, uh, hidden drivers. And ultimately <clears throat> at the first deployments, which is normally within six to eight weeks with, with an organization, it's important to make certain, to connect certain dots with leadership team, extended leadership, and also the organization. So folk can actually understand that we see the results we do and where we put the effort. And yes, the most important thing, Kevin, sometimes we put so much effort around what doesn't, um, not that it doesn't matter, but that shouldn't be the top priority. Uh, if you think of 80, 20 principles, you look at them, you know, which are the high margin products and where do we really can make a step change to get people somewhat motivated? Um, we have to understand that product mix, uh, what's hurting, um, you know, and it's not just where we actually uh, uh, um, produce or manufacture. It's really a lot to do with some of the supply chain aspects as well. How we schedule changeovers, extended runs versus extensive you know, short, short runs, whatever the impact may be. So there are so many non-core functions that are pivotal to this, this process. So, you know, once we have that for me in, the, in looking, knowing how we really operate and what would make us successful, matching that up with this, uh, to your point, this elaborate uh, sort of mission statement that's very generic, um, I can ask so many, people out there uh, in, in the different organizations where I've worked as well, that, you know, what does the mission statement tell you or our purpose statement? And it's, um, if they know it, it's yes, something like that or this and the other, it's not specific enough. We have to be deliberate. We have to be specific. We have to call it out. You know, um, this is a, we transform raw materials into finished goods. Uh, um, we, uh, we lead in with its platform, uh, uh, process and product platform management uh, to drive standardization or whether it's a, a continuous process where we have high volume, low variety and, and with the you know, uptime and first time right product. So what does it mean? I, I need a, a process control expertise. We, we actually can take you from solving a basic problem using the five whys through design of experiments. You're gonna, we're gonna evolve your capability. You, you have an opportunity to become, you know, a, a, a build a career that's highly technical and or operational, whatever the case may be. It, we have to connect that to, to the individual. And, and, and I would rather keep it as simple as that, uh, you know. No, you, and you, you talk about um, leaders being stretched, and I see this in so many places, but I, I almost see, or not even leaders, everybody being stretched. But I, I see that a lot as the, the fault of the leadership team, right? So if, if people are overly stretched, one thing you can do, and you talked about reorganizing so that you've got the right people in the right places and they've got a passion yeah. for the work that they do. But I think the other one is just simply setting better priorities and it, it always seems to be a challenge when i go in places what are people going to say no to 
um, because that's really what priority setting and focus is all about. And I, I love the fact that you mentioned the word focus as well, because you know we can't do anything unless we're really well focused on it. Do you have a specific method for going into a company and finding the right priorities? I, I know you talked a lot about looking at results and trying to figure out the, yeah. the key drivers. <laughs> is that like the main the main way that you would identify their main priorities? Yeah, Kevin. So so most certainly, um, if if I see if you look at the losses within going into a manufacturing concern or a, a plant, and I know we 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 haven't we do a lot of you know innovation on site and we launched a lot of trials and initiatives which you know within a continuous process where we actually you know let's say fill or assemble at a high rate so again high volume flowing through so the last thing we want is downtime and also the last thing you want of course is you know not getting it first time right so bringing in a lot of extensive trials that system that process has to be flawless having that organization as part of the rd organization for example in R&D would be to some extent distant, depending on where that organization resides and how that connects with, with the core and some of the engineering non-core functions and how they execute within operations and, and what the startup leadership looks like in that process. That's all pivotal you know, uh, for success there. Um, but, but I will say that the, the approach, the, the, historical traditional approach of, of management by objective removal. So understanding our losses, we prioritize, and I make sure we, we prioritize the right ones, not just for delivering the short-term financial objectives and targets which are expected, but also looking at the outer years. So what capability do we need to build this year and why? And uh, making that very um, known to the entire organization, not just by saying we are going to do, you know, basic autonomous maintenance, basic process control development, we're going to leverage leverage SPC, you know, within operations in this manner. Um, we're going to implement a rough cut capacity planning process or an SNOP uh, system that looks a little admit that works in this manner to deliver those results. But also we have to tell the organization and with managers and engineers is these are the objectives we're gonna be focusing on to be deliberate in delivering that capability. As much as what we know, the results will come. It's imperative to put a lot of emphasis on capability building um, and, and ownership of, of these systems. Um, most functions find it very difficult to understand that they own a system that cuts horizontally across the organization. If you think of inventory management, that resi it resides with the supply chain organization, but however, you know, everyone has a hand on handle on, on that uh, de deliverable. So roles and responsibility, that little bit of catch ball activity remains pivotal in the beginning of, of, of the year, uh, where your objective that you set for the next of months includes capability for the next three years. That right. journey has to be clear and that journey has to be revisited numerous times with leadership i've no i've, right. I've figured, you know that re repetition and 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 confirmation is pivotal we I, I cannot you know emphasize that enough is um there's not a moment of coaching that i that i do not spend some minutes on just talking a little about you know what do we see you know our reward recognition system you know we talk we, we have phenomenal uh, uh, you know, systems in place that provides leadership and managers tools to recognize others. Now, what are we looking for when we recognize others? Are we matching all of this with the, the work needed, necessary to deliver the next 12 months, plus the work needed, necessary to deliver the next three years in capability? You know, if we just target results for year one, year two, year, I, I would say that's okay. But for year one, you know, we should feel confident we're going to deliver year one because we have a three-year plan for in view of capability. For year two, we're going to feel very confident, highly confident that we're going to be in a good place because we've been building the right capability. Disconnecting that, those two fundamental aspects of transforming, 
you know, not just product and process, but also people is, is what makes it happen. Um, so I, I love the fact that each time that we've spoken, you, yeah. you've talked about people and it's about, and, and we talk about manufacturing or I know you like to call it transformation, right? Trans yes. Transforming products. Um, but in order to do that, you need to help the people transform also. They're, they're becoming new people. You're, you're the person who, who becomes the person who can make the product better, right? So there's that whole level of capability building. And th yeah. there's this idea that the dream can't be bigger than the team, right? We have to continually build the team in order to be able to reach a, a new dream. And um, how do you then, what, what what are some practical examples of how you would build team capability? Okay, um, so here's an example. So just getting into a manufacturing concern, and I've got this maintenance organization, let's say, as an example, yeah. and we're in a continuous process one more time where lines could run 100 units a minute and higher up to maybe 1,000 for that matter. Um, many businesses think of having a subject matter expert that just is a coach for the different, you know, for the organization across multiple lines. It's very helpful. However, how do you take a highly diverse organization where we still have a high number of touches and, you know, think of the past year with a higher turnover in general, um, how do we accelerate skill build? How do we do that? We have to think about taking some of our core maintenance skill sets and have that within operation. So, really reorganizing here yeah, for example we created uh, uh um, we've got reliability maintenance mechanics and process maintenance mechanics process maintenance me maintenance mechanics are moved into operations so across shifts that is where my reliability maintenance mechanics we invest in their external learning uh, they, they they transfer knowledge to the process mechanics and hence to the to, to the uh, equipment technicians and operators uh, that's a simple uh, sort of a career path as well, but also a, 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 a sort of deliberate process to transfer knowledge and know-how. Now, it's important to create, because it doesn't stop there, you know, without communication, Kevin Ash, you know, nothing's going to happen. So at the line level, across shifts, we need that window of that handshake, that communication window, that board where... We can talk short interval control if we want to. However, what is the one thing the line team is going to focus on today? So we created these line activity boards per line and together with the process mechanic and the line lead uh, with the operators, they would talk about shift to shift handover, but they would also talk about the specific, uh, the highest loss driver, highest stops for that prior shift and what will be the plan for today where they then align on at least two shifts align on what the focus would be. The line team with the process mechanics may resolve and come up with, with an activity for the day that'll make the results better for the next 24 hours. Um, from that forum, uh, the, the frontline manager would bring that to another uh, visual management, what we call green area or productive uh, workspace which is really just, you know, PDCA and by line. And then honestly, what happens there is the, the manager of the department with support functions, quality, supply plan, chain planning, um, and so forth would be present and liability maintenance then would be present to understand whether the problems require, you know, their support from coming off the, the, the previous shift. And if there are multiple lines requiring support, they would prioritize where the focus would would be um, and that's how the priorities are set for that day for that shift based upon what the customer needs are and available resources that we have present that day so that's a simple design tweak uh, that gives that helps skill build within operations helps the clarification of the nature of the problem and then get the problem pro prioritized in, in in the next level meeting or I'd like to, I don't call it meetings, by the way, I also call it work sessions, because these aren't meetings, these are truly part of the way we transform people. So it's not a meeting. <laughs> I get a lot yeah. to do meetings, meetings of this. Maybe we have meetings, but the, these are work sessions and meetings we can reduce, but these we can improve. So that's my philosophy there. Now I will tell you this much. 
Um, once this was put in place, um, I observed the next thing, of course. Um, you know, you get my labeler went down or my label is a problem on the line. It gets to the next roll up work session uh, with the visual workplace discussion with all the support functions and, and what shall we get? My labeler is an issue. Uh, I have labeler jams. So you can tell the problem statement is not refined. Um, so then, then we start with problem solving training, basic uh, steps, how to think about uh, what's transpired, you know, uh, are you at base condition? Are your basic standards in place? So a simple checklist. Ultimately, there's a refined problem statement, which then flow to the next level work session, where comfortably the, the is able to say, well, I need a quality expert today to support this problem solving. We're going to do a, and we establish these visual boards, big Ishikawas, really a fish own big blocks. And then for the top two or three uh, possible causes, we have the five whys and a new standard, proposed standard. So these boards are wheeled to the lines and leadership flows flow to the problem solving area. We've been doing that now for a couple of years, a uh, year, uh, same with Enduracell. So a lot of this has is, is, is been extremely helpful at the front end. Uh, we learn immediately the communication gaps. You, 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 Leadership can go and attend and coach these sessions at the line and, and or in the department. And then we, we decide, you know, what are we looking for when we observe these interactions? Um, and it's, it's been phenomenal. You know, I, I think of our safety results that's yeah, improved by 50% over a period of 18 months. Is how, how does this happen? Uh, within that review process, we have a quality trigger, safety triggers, and per line, uh, Get the organization to change the triggers they want to look at is because what does the line and their process tell them? What are they learning about their process technology and or their product handling the waste stream and everything else? It may be different for certain lines. So making it that to getting folk to be autonomous to that extent is, is impactful. Now I will say all of this uh, has to be complemented, and, and as you know, with with a reward recognition system that you know helps the organization learn, but also grow. We want to see promotions, want to see people flow through, want to see people get recognized. You know, with a discussion, uh, whether it's star or star of the month, whether it's whatever it may be. You know, uh, we have in place, so we are very deliberate in in recognizing people for their contribution, and. But the, but the day isn't done unless we actually have a site review or site work session as well. It, it's about 15 minutes long. And within that work process, what we do is we, we get a, an update or feedback from the different leaders as to what we see uh, with regards to health of the organization. And also we assign different roles depending what, what the outcome is. We, we flow to work really as leadership um, where we coach and support um, the organization at line level and or in the departments. That's manufacturing executive Lionel Moss, who has successfully transformed a number of plants. He has a unique approach where he starts by dissecting a manufacturing company's purpose and then aligning that purpose and the individuals to team goals that transform the success of the company. We'll have part two of our conversation next week with Lionel Moss on episode 154 of Make It Right. I hope you'll join us.